Hello and welcome everyone to a very special event this evening in which we get to meet some of the winning artists of this year's Linden Postcard Show. I'm Melinda Munn and I'm the Gallery Director here at Linden New Art and tonight I'm joined by my co-host. Juliet Hansen. I'm the Curator at Linden New Art and it's great to be here with everyone tonight. Sadly tonight, we're not all gathered in our beautiful gallery with a glass of wine in hand as we wander around the gallery and see all everyone's wonderful art on the walls. So we have a little bit of a mix of in the gallery and at home. So tonight I'm wel welcoming you from my home and our guests will be joining us from their homes. Um, some of them are interstate, so it's very nice to have them. And you will be joining us from your homes. Wherever you are, you're very welcome. If you've suddenly found yourself at this event and you're not sure what's happening, or if YouTube has recommended this video for you, it's all right. We'll look after you as we go. Um, so let's get started with some of the basics. Can you tell us a little bit about Linden New Art, Melinda? So Linden's mission is to support Brave New Art by mid-career artists and engage visitors through inspiring, thought-provoking exhibitions of their new work. Tonight, we celebrate one of our most iconic exhibitions, the Linden Postcard Show, an open entry exhibition made up of hundreds, in fact, thousands of small scale works. Each year, the exhibition and the gallery explodes with colour as artworks in every theme imaginable are hung on our beautiful gallery walls. Tonight, we're coming to you live on YouTube and Facebook. And if you haven't had a chance to see the exhibition in real life, you have until the 31st of January to visit us here at the gallery. You'll need to book a spot via our website at lindenarts.org. And of course, if you see an artwork that you want to buy this evening, you can go online to lindenpostcardshow.com.au to snap up that piece. And if you're watching us live tonight and would like to make a comment, you'll need to log into the platform you're watching us from. We'd love to hear from you. Simply click on the say something or write a comment box at the bottom of the live chat area to get started. If you're watching from a TV, well, I congratulate you because you've worked out how to do that and you're possibly a little bit too clever, but chatting gets a little bit complicated. So we recommend that you chat through a computer, tablet or mobile device. So for everyone joining us tonight, tell us one thing that you love about the Linden Postcard Show. Do you know what I love about it, Mel? Um, personally, every year, it's when the artworks first start arriving at the gallery and we get to see them for the first time. And this year, it was a little bit different because everything was posted to us. We got to unwrap the boxes as the artworks arrived. So it was a little bit like Christmas um, and that element of surprise, because that's the thing about the postcard show. You never know what you're going to get. You never know what's gonna be on the walls when you come to see it. But um, we're lucky because we get to see everything before it even goes onto the walls. So I just love that surprise aspect to the postcard show. What do you, what do you think's your favorite thing about it? I love how the audience becomes really vocal in this exhibition. So <laughs> I love hearing the conversations that kind of seep up the stairs into my office and I hear people disagreeing with each other about which they think is the best work, the one that they want to take home. Um, and this year I had a really great conversation when um, a guy came in to come and look at the postcard show on the opening weekend mm -hmm. and he walked into the gallery and he saw a photograph on the wall that someone had taken of him actually walking into Elwood Sailing Club. And he recognised himself. So there was this really awesome moment where he was like, man walks into gallery to see himself walking into another building, which I thought was really fun and really lovely. Um, I also love finding out where the artworks end up. And often one of the things that I have in my job is that I often end up in collectors' houses and I'll see this lovely little collection of postcard show works behind them or in their office or something like that and it's really lovely when we hear see that where, where they where they end up it's really quite lovely and it's really nice to see some of the comments tonight so we've got someone from Vancouver in Canada so welcome Rosalind it's really lovely to have you joining us this evening um, 
it's also really nice that people just love the kind of variety of the show. I think it's a real smorgasbord of what art has been in. And I think one of the things that's been interesting in this year's show is that you can see some of the work from that's really been inspired by the lockdown in Melbourne. And we'll meet one of the artists tonight whose work actually was a response to that. But also there's lots of images of people in masks. There's lots of images of people kind of really, you know, making the most of their lockdown time to be creative, which is interesting. Yeah, it's been interesting to see. The show does always have that aspect that it's kind of um, a snapshot of the art scene in Melbourne at a certain time, which of course always reflects the kind of broader social or political things that are happening. It's really special for that reason too. Um, can see some really lovely comments coming in as well. Um, yeah, about the sheer variety and um, how it reflects um, the creativity that exists in Melbourne. We're so lucky in this city in that way. It's a really great thing. And I noticed that there's some people trying to, joining us from Fremantle in WA. Welcome. It's probably a little early in the afternoon for you. Welcome, Elijah. It's nice to have you here this evening. I think probably what we should do now is jump in for those of people like Elijah, who mightn't have been able to come and see the show um, because we've, you know, locked down our borders, um, to actually show a short video of the actual exhibition this year. So I'll bring that on the screen right now. to see the show like that and I hope if you've seen your work let us know on the screen but also if you've seen a family member's work or a friend's it'd be great to let us know in the chat. I'd like to begin tonight by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we all virtually meet this evening. Tonight I'm joining you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation here in Melbourne. Juliet and some of the team in the gallery this evening are joining us from the lands of the Bunurong people in Melbourne, as are some of the artists who are here with us tonight. 
I pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. And whilst we meet virtually this evening, tonight draws upon the ancient history of this land and it reflects the millennia of experiences of Aboriginal people coming together to celebrate, to learn and to connect. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to any First Nations people who are joining us here this evening. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to six of the winning artists from this year's postcard show. Gabrielle Bates, Jenny Anjet, Ruth Hellema, Mark Hopper, Michael Klug, and Susan Morris. Tonight I'll be asking the artists some questions, um, but if you have a question, do pop it in the chat. Melinda will be checking the chat and she will pass on those questions to me and we can um, address them and, um, you know, find out the answers that you'd like to find out. Um, so we're going to start by talking with Gabrielle. So hello, Gabrielle. Um, Gabrielle um, won the Henry Award, um, which is the best abstract award with her piece called Talisman 2. And um, Gabrielle's actually joining us from Gadigal land in Sydney, home to the Eora Nation. Um, so welcome, Gabrielle. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, mm -hmm. I might start by asking how long you've been practicing as an artist. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how your practice has developed along the way. Well, I've been practicing for 30 years, Juliet. Uh, I started off doing a, a two year tape course and went on to do a, uh, an undergrad um, Bachelor of Arts and then I did an honours and then I did a two years of a master's degree as well. So in total, I've been studying for eight years, about 30 years, and when I haven't been studying, I've been exhibiting or doing residencies internationally. So I've been busy. Wow, could you maybe tell us about some of the residencies you've done? That sounds sure. quite amazing. Yeah, they were. Um, I, I did a residency in Australia first, and then I went out to uh, Malaysia and lived for a year in a place called Rimbun Dahan. Um, under the auspices of um, Hidas Kaskiri and Associates, who paid for everything. It was amazing. And from those experiences and the contact I made with um, people in Southeast Asia, I went on to live in the jungle in Penang and do a residency there. And I also went out to do residency in um, the Philippines as well. So um, busy. Yes. And what mm. kind of work were you making at that time? Because the work, the, the winning work in the show is, is quite sculptural in a way. Um, have you always worked in that, that field or what were you doing? No, at no, no. My, I, um, most of my work comes out of um, a paint, painting. But um, in the last few years when I was doing my master's, I started to develop um, more of a sculptural aesthetic, as you say. And from there, I've moved into performance and just recently into photo media. So I've really been trying a lot of different platforms. But there's a, you know, there's a, there's a thread that runs through all of those, those platforms. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about that thread? What do you see? Because there's mm -hmm. such diverse areas to be working on. What are, you, what are some of the key themes that you, you tend to look at? Uh, the themes specifically are things like uh, ritual and witchcraft and uh, the way in which um, different materials and ideas can be used to protect us and to tell us things about the places that we live in. Because mm, I was wondering about the title of the work, um, Talisman, because um, you have three works uh, in the postcard show and they're, they're, they all have that title. Um, so I guess a talisman is like a, it's a magical object or can be something that brings you luck. Um, and I wondered if that's um, how you felt about the works themselves or about art making, whether those things have that magical mm. or lucky quality to them. They're definitely made um, for magical purposes. They're meant to be uh, placed either over a doorway or a, a fireplace threshold. Um, they're used um, to the, the idea is to to remind you that you're safe, to feel secure, 
to protect you from malevolent forces. And of course, when I made those works, I was specifically thinking about ill health, sickness, viruses. The, um, there's a secondary title to those works, which was called The Day We, Worked in, we Walked in Circles Contemplating the End of the World. So all of those um, artworks use a circular device through them to push through the idea. Yes, I was wondering, I was going to ask you about the specific forms that you've used within those works. And then some of them have a, a kind of a binding process or and some of them yeah. have things filled in. Is that, mm -hmm. do they have kind of particular meanings, those um, yeah. techniques as well? Yeah, everything that's uh, used in those objects is, is, is loaded with uh, meaning and magical purpose. Uh, Spellbinding is one particular way in which we hold the intention within the work. Um, fetish objects like uh, nails and certain types of pigment and also burning. A, you'll see that there are charcoal marks or candle smoke marks in the works as well. They're all parts uh, of really consolidating the intention of the work, of the spell that you're trying to create, which of course is one protection. Mm. Um, and I think it's possible for us to have a look at the work as well. Um, so we can see this is this is the the winning work itself. So this one, um, yes, you can see all the circles and and the binding. Did you find it a challenge, given the the scope of your practice as you've explained it to us? Did you find it quite a challenge to work at this more diminutive scale for the postcard show? Um, no, I work on a variety of scales and I actually found these ones came really naturally and easily. They were really clear to me and I know that I have to make a work when it's clear. So mm -hmm. these ones these ones didn't didn't feel difficult or challenging. Some works I wrestle with for a very long time. But these ones, yeah, they you know, when my when when I know what I'm doing, which I did with these, it was um it came out very fast. Wow. So do you, can you see in your mind the image of the work before you begin or do you build no. it through an intuitive kind of process? No, I work in a, an intuitive uh, process where I assemble all of my materials and then I look for them to start speaking to one another. I'm always looking for a relational dynamic and that, that can uh, evolve in many different ways. But they're there. that's the essential thing that I look at, the, the way in which uh, materials talk to one another. I see. And do you build the different parts that we can see within this work? Do you build lots of those parts and then experiment and put them together or do you make yes. them? Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I definitely, there's a lot of juggling around before they essentially come together. There's a lot of play involved and that's one of the fun things about what I do. It's, you know, I go to the studio each day to play essentially and um, <laughs> to have a conversation with these materials. And so it's really fun. That's the best. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it would seem like, you know, your travel and your residencies um, would have impacted your thinking about your practice. Um, I'm interested to know if you actually look to any other um, artists or uh, is there some sort of external um, influences that, that really have an impact on what you do? I think um, there's an artist from the Philippines named Norberto Roldan, who is an absolutely superb artist. And he, he, he opened a doorway for me to understand or, or to, to come to know more about the idea of animism, which is something that's so inherent to Australian Indigenous cosmology, but it was just something I hadn't delved into before my time in the Philippines. So not only did he introduce me to witchcraft and animism, um, he also just helped me understand more about um, working with different materials and those dynamics and relationships as well. So, um, yeah, that is a major influence for me. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, I'm so pleased to know more about that. Um, I'm sure along the way people might think of some questions which we might be able to pop in at the end. Oh, in fact, somebody's popped in right now. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to know, are the materials that you use significant um, in terms of them being talismans? I suppose this one contains a lot of wood, for example. Yeah, well, all of the work that I use is recycled, all of the materials, so that's really important to my practice. I don't like to make new things specifically. I like to repurpose and reuse. Um, but, yes, uh, we've kind of already covered it in a previous question, Di, um, 
the materials are deeply significant. They all have um, deep magical potency. And I actually wrote a master's thesis about um, the different qualities of those materials and the way in which they can work and combine together to generate um, magical potential. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. That was, uh, seemed like an incredibly quick six minutes. Um, <laughs> um, we, it's time to move on to, uh, to meet the next artist. So thank you so much. And thank I you. Questions. Hi. Hello. Hello, Ruth. Um, we're now um, by Ruth Halema. Um, Ruth. Jenny Ann. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Terribly <laughs> sorry, Jenny Ann. Um, All right. Uh, so, Jenny Ann, you actually um, won the first prize in the postcard show, the Artist yeah. Encouragement Award, support, supported by Elwood Community Bank, and it was for the beautiful work, At Night She's Dreaming of a Plastic Love. Um, I might begin by finding out a little bit more about how long you've been working with photography and, again, how your practice might have developed along the way. Sure. Um I always wanted a camera. Um, I got a little 110 film camera for my 18th birthday, which when I got a roll process, the guy at the developing shop said, who hates you <laughs> for giving me that because the 110 was so tiny. Um, I did um, part of a diploma at Mount Lawley TAFE um, in photography. That Before that, I'd mostly been taking photos of bands that I loved um, in, in concert. Um, and I learned in that course um, something that's really central to me now, which is to sort of focus on a small thing and for a detail. Um, just that's how with my work, it's it's kind of like small things or small portions of things um, that it's like I've zoomed in on, um, and they're in a small scale. Um, so that started there. I see. Um, I imagine when you're photographing bands, it's really important to try and sort of capture, yeah, um, moments as they happen. And I really feel like you've been able to do that with with this image um, that's been the winning image. Um, I don't know if we can have a look at the, the image now. Um, it, it's a real kind of moment in time but there's such movement to it as well do you think that experience in photographing bands may, might have helped you in some way to capture this image do you see that the connection or i'm not sure this is actually a composite of two photographs um yeah. and the plastic bag was actually lying on the ground so it was little. It was on the step walking back down from Sacre Coeur and Montmartre and um, it was just on one of the landings and it had a green wine bottle next to it and it just looked really pretty. But what I also do is I, I'll take a photo of something that I've seen and then I want to remove the other things that, that aren't what I want to show, I guess. So... Um, the cloud was taken out the window of a friend's car in Canberra because they have really amazing clouds there. And the, I guess part of the floatingness is just literally that I put it in front of the cloud. So it actually looks like it's floating, but the, the material itself is very floaty and I've made it more like that just with my editing sort of... Um, brought out some of the richness of the differences in the texture and the colours. Yeah, that's interesting. So I suppose um, a big part of your process is finding um, th these small things or things that interest you out in the world. And so that's sort of a, a selecting of things. And then you will often bring different images back in and, and select items. Do you often combine things in the way that you have for this work? and then select from images that you've already created? 
uh, I was really lucky and had long service leave two years ago and my partner Peter and I went around the world and um, I, I think the first time I did one of these was a photo I took in Canada that was of a paper dress in an airport and it was such a beautiful fine piece of work but obviously I didn't want the background of the airport and I put that against a cloud and I did something else with this beautiful gold disco shoe I took a photo of in, London, in um, New York and I used a cloud for that but it was a storm cloud with the grey the grey behind and then a very bright glittery shoe in the front. Um, I've done other things besides clouds but I have this thing about clouds <laughs> and things that are glittery and things that are beautiful sort of girly colours. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was um I was wondering with this this work because the the title is so poetic it kind of suggests a, definitely a positive feeling towards the plastic. Um mm. but of course I suppose we're all very aware at the moment of um you know protecting the environment and the need to reduce our use of plastic and especially in a single use plastics like the plastic bag. Um, I did wonder if that was part of your thinking with this work, a sort of environmental I, message. I'm having a little bit of trouble because I took a photo under the Eiffel Tower of um, this beautiful pink lolly wrapper, hot pink foil against a, like a, almost a terrazzo background. And when I put it on Instagram, I put a caption saying that at the Eiffel Tower, even the litter is beautiful, written in French. And I got into trouble with that. Like, no, litter is never beautiful. Um, I guess I wasn't actually promoting litter. But um, it, with this one as well, um, I've got another iteration of it where it's in a snow globe and it's a plastic snow globe with mylar glitter. And so... In that sense, it's actually more overtly about climate change and pollution because it's actually a picture of a plastic bag in a plastic globe with the plastic glitter in front of it. So it makes it a little bit more obvious. But um, I think like it's important, even if you are, are trying to make a point, that it's there's something that's beautiful and that um, engages people um, that, that makes you look at the image in the first place. The, the title comes from because I, what I do on my Instagram is I find lyrics to put as my initial hashtags and I found that one which originally the, the words are at night she's dreaming of a beautiful feeling of a plastic glove but I contracted it obviously for the name of the piece. <laughs> but, yeah. and, um, I do like the lyricalness literally of lyrics um, and the interaction between the lyrics and the image. Yes, it's beautiful. It's to the floaty feeling as well. It does. It has such a dreamlike quality to it, um, and and quite surreal. And actually, as Mel mentioned um, earlier, it is always you know good to get uh, visitor feedback. And one visitor pointed out, um, and now I can't unsee this when I look at the work. The kind of the face in the bag as well. Is that something? Yeah. Did you notice is that? Why you liked no. the particular? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that wasn't deliberate. And I, I hadn't noticed it until somebody else said it to me. When <laughs> it, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and do you usually work at this scale? Is this, um, and I know you, you said you were interested in, you know, the, the smaller um, mm. things that you might notice. So did it suit you very well to actually make a work that was quite small or do you usually go yeah. larger? When I moved here from Perth, I moved in next to Linden Gallery and I, basically been going to the postcard show every year and just the concept of the postcard show just it was delighting to me because of that scale thing um and I always kind of thought one day it would be lovely if I was in it so this is really great um I haven't um worked in large prints because I haven't had a good enough camera but I've used my money from price and I've got myself a really nice camera now so I will be able to do bigger shots <laughs> and bigger pieces so yeah I'm really um, happy with that. that's the best that's the best result <laughs> uh, well thank you so much for for letting us know more about uh, your practice and the work and congratulations again on on winning the postcard show this year thanks thank so you. much Tanya
And now we are joined by Ruth. Hello, Matt. Um, <laughs> yes, hello, um, everyone. <laughs> um, Ruth won the Best of St Kilda artwork um, that's supported by This Week in St Kilda magazine for her work titled Coexistence, St Kilda, Melbourne. Um, again, I might start by asking you um, how long you've been working with photography and has that always been your medium? Um, well, I've always loved art. One of my favourite places in, in the world is to be in an art gallery. Um, and and the one thing that I always wanted to do was actually to, um, to take up photography. Um, I guess I took a while to actually do that. In 2006, I did a short course um, and I was living overseas at that time and started just basically wandering around the streets and practising and um, trying to hone my skills a little bit. And also um, learning, and this took probably longer than the basic um, technical elements, learning what a good photograph actually looks like. Um, that, took, uh, that took quite a while. Um, so, yes, uh, it was really just a hobby at that stage and um, it wasn't really until I came back to Australia in um, 2013, I think it was, or 12 maybe now, um, when I decided that I wanted to take it a little bit more seriously. It's um, not my day job, unfortunately, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I decided that I wanted to take it, wanted it to become more than just um, just a hobby. So, with my partner, my partner and I had a joint exhibition, um, latent images of, of Spain, and that was at the Robbie Burns Hotel. And then a couple of years later, in two thousand and eighteen, I had my first solo exhibition. It was very exciting. Um, mm -hmm. That was about flower photography uh, called Seeing Flowers. And that was on a ton of gas works. And I've, you know, exhibited a couple of, you know, group um, shows and was very excited from 2019 onwards to, to exhibit at Linden. Um, I remember going to the opening night. I mean, I've been to the postcard show a couple of times, but that opening night really impressed me with its vibrance and, and energy. And I thought, well, I really want to be a part of this. So, um, <laughs> so I was very excited about, um, about exhibiting in the postcard show. And um, thank you for making it happen because last year was obviously a very, very challenging year. And um, at times it must have looked like it really wasn't going to go ahead. So, um, so just very grateful for the opportunity to, to exhibit. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, so the image itself, the, the winning image, um, is an image that will seem very familiar to St Kilda locals. Um, are, you, are you local and do you, are you often inspired by things that you see around St Kilda or did you make this image um, because it was at Linden in St Kilda for the postcard show? Well, that's an interesting question, actually. It's a, there's a bit of a lockdown story here. Um, I was kind of looking for a new direction in my in ph my photography and kind of had been for a while. Um, and I decided that I'd go back to my first love of um, architecture, um, but that I definitely wanted to explore more black and white photography and high contrast photography. So this was before lockdown. I thought, great, I'm going to go to the city. That'll be the best place for, you know, the contrast that I'm looking for with all of the tall buildings and everything and shadows, etc. So that was the plan and then lockdown started. And so I was a little bit disappointed, I must admit, because I thought, you know, here was my great idea. Um, I, you know, really felt like I'd found that, that new direction. And I thought, well, you know, there's not really not much of that contrast that I'm, that I'm looking for in, in St Kilda and certainly not a lot of all buildings that would interest me. But um, I got over that initial disappointment a couple of days later and thought, well, really, you know, have you looked around? Um, have you searched for those contrasts before? Have you really focused on the architecture in St Kilda? And I realised very quickly that I walk, you know, through the streets every day, but that perhaps I hadn't really focused as much on the architecture and all of the detail that the architecture has. And of course, you know, I hadn't because um, I went out a couple of days later um, on my usual walk and, um, and walked past the apartment building that you see and looked at it, I guess, in a totally different light and was just thought that it was absolutely stunning. Um, 
So that's when I decided, oh, I have to come back here when um, the light is the way that I want it to be um, to, to take a shot of this, of this building. Yeah. Um, I was interested to know too whether you often work in black and white or whether that was a decision with this image. You mentioned that you were looking for contrast and of course um, black and white would feed into that, the theme in the work. Um, maybe you could, um, yeah, tell us a little bit more about whether you work in black and white a lot but also maybe a little bit more about that idea of of contrast and how, how you see that appearing um, maybe in the architecture. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, maybe I'll go back to this photo firstly, actually, and just picking up on, on the idea of, of contrast. So, mm -hmm. as I was saying, what really um, inspired me to go and rush and get my camera was the, was the apartment building and the, the deep contrast that I saw because this linked in with the direction that I wanted to, to take my photography. So, working on the you know, black and white high contrast. And when I looked at this building, I mean, it does have colour. Um, but I saw it in black and white, essentially. So I went back at a time when there was very strong sunlight so that I could capture some of those contrasts. And then I really heightened them a lot in post-production. Um, the time of the day, it was taken at about uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, it was my lunch break that day, actually. And um, so I really heightened the, the shadows, the lights in, in post-production. And just to get the element of contrast happening even more, I decided to also include the ESPY um, next door. And of course, this brought a whole new element to the photograph because it brought in the juxtaposition of the old and the new. So it wasn't just about the contrast of the light and the dark but this additional element coming into the, into the photograph. And um, also the, the SP relies much more on rectangles and squares as its um, basic, um, as its basic um, architecture. So I love the, the mix of, of these two buildings. I love the contrast. It's a very, for me, it's a, there's a very sharp contrast here, but there's also a certain harmony which I see between the old and, and the new. And I think that it really enhances the architectural surrounds of, of St Kilda. Yeah, thank you. And then going back to black and white and colour, mm. the mm. first part of your question, I guess in most of my work, I really look for, for contrast. So the flower exhibition, seeing flowers that I had a couple of years ago, used colour, very, very strong colours in the, in, the in the photos that I took there of flowers. Of course, flowers lending themselves on many occasions to that rich um, colour. Um, the black and white here in this photo was because of my decision to um, really explore that area a little bit more particularly in architecture and of having found the, you know, well, not found, but rediscovered or seen these two buildings in, in a new light. At the moment, um, I'm actually working a little bit more in colour again. Um, mm. It makes a fine art um, architectural photography, which is, I think, what you see here, and also with minimalism. And mm. what I'm focusing on is um, facades in the Port Phillip area. And like Jenny Ann, I don't normally um, shoot a, the uh, subject matter in its entirety. I tend to focus on particular elements. And so looking at those facades, I'm focusing on particular elements there. And that's um, because I've been invited to um, exhibit um, with some other artists, Baker Gasworks, um, later on this, um, this year. Then the plan, when I've submitted those images, is to go back to black and white and really explore the black and white um, here more because that's, um, I mean, black and white is just so rich and so wonderful. I love black and white and, and always have really, you know, whether it be taking photos or, or looking at photos. Mm. Um, we've had a few questions coming in. Yes, um, I can see that. <laughs> um, Ada's asking if you would take more photos around Melbourne or any other city for that matter that show that kind of contrast. I think she's maybe meaning the, the contrast of the old and the new mm -hmm. um, that's quite prevalent within Melbourne. Yes, I think it is actually. And um, this particular sort of contrast between an old and new, it's not something that I've explored in my work very much. When I was living overseas in Spain, 
um, my architectural work there was much more about traditional uh, architecture. Uh, the city does have some modern architecture. Were I to go back now, I would probably explore that um, a little bit more, but it is, it is mainly traditional architecture. So mm -hmm. with this sort of area in my work, it's something that, um, that I really want to explore a lot more in, in Melbourne. Um, and and the greater Melbourne, you know, um, if we um, if we don't go into lockdown or something horrible like that again. So at the moment, I'm just focusing on the Port Phillip um, area because of this um, the exhibition that's coming up. And once again, I'm just surprised and stunned by the amount of detail in the architecture, both old and and new. But I want to get out into greater Melbourne and and get into the city too. Um, to um, to follow that original plan. So much to be inspired by in Melbourne. Exactly. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Ruth. That was um, amazing to hear more about um, what inspires you and um, what inspired your work. Um, congratulations and thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you and thanks again <laughs> to Lyndon and also to Twisk for the award. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>
this is in the fortress of Sigurea, which is in the middle uh, section of um, of Sri Lanka. Uh, it's I think six hundred meters high, or it's, anyway, it's a huge rock that's in the middle of Sri Lanka, and the the king uh, made a palace out of the the uh, ceiling of it, uh, and it's quite a it's quite a trip to get up there, and it's uh, it was incredibly hot. Uh, halfway up there is uh, a series of caves uh, in which there are some alfresco paintings along the side. Um, we were kind of parked in an area, um, uh, and I looked across, and there was a local school group. Uh, the last section, you you actually have to go up a ladder which is bolted to the side of the rock. And I wasn't feeling too confident about doing that. But I looked across and I saw these two schoolboys that were there and the light hit their face and they had the kind of uh, apprehension or, or whatever on their faces that uh, and I, I took that image and as soon as it happened, I knew that it was a magical moment. Wow, so you really do get a sense almost instantly that you've caught something quite special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very yeah. much. So did you, did you um, do you manipulate your images afterwards or do you tend to, to shoot things and, and capture things as they are? And that's I don't think too much manipulation. Part of, uh, part of what um, this year presented was that I wasn't able to travel uh, or have people come to my studio for uh, for portraits. So I kind of revisited some of the images that I, that I had. Uh, this one always came back to me as something that was special. Uh, so other than just positioning and uh, cropping, uh, there's really, really not much other than what, uh, what happened through the lens that day. Mm. Um, so when you were in Sri Lanka, was that a trip um, that you took expecting to get some photographs there or were you travelling for, for other reasons as well? Or are you always with your camera just in case? I'm always. I am always <laughs> with my camera. Whether it be the, the streets of St Kilda or like I was today or, um, or just... Um, Traveling the world, which I love and miss, uh, you know, I've always had my camera with me, and it's it's always the people that I'm trying to to capture while uh, while I'm, I'm out there. I wondered about that actually, whether um, portraiture is is going to you feel like that's going to be your continuing focus with your work, or has has anything else? caught your attention in the same way as portraiture or do you think this is this is what you're the most interested in? Uh, I reckon it's my calling. I, mm. still, uh, <laughs> I still take a, a lot of photos of, uh, of bands and uh, and the music scene but mm. in, in a way that's portraiture in itself just sitting waiting for a moment and, and waiting for a look and and, and just trying to capture that inner soul and that kind of thing. And look, the, uh, it's th this week I actually had the first person back in my in my studio at home here, and it was such a joy and for me and unfortunately to for the person that I was photographing to actually break down those barriers that were, you know we've been putting up with for the last or living through for the last almost 12 months so, oh, absolutely yeah. um are there are there any artists that also work in um with, with photography and portraiture that you particularly admire or look to or are you quite um intuitively driven by by your own interests uh, I've kind of looked at uh, a few photographers that I really admire. When I first started taking photographs of bands, there was a guy called Graham Weber who was a, a local photographer. Uh, took a lot of beautiful, beautiful photos, and I kind of got a bit of an inspiration. Once I got the, the taste for it, 
I got uh, inspiration for the way that he photographed people, particularly side stage and just waiting for particular uh, opportunities. Uh, but uh, I think that there's, there's something that, um, that came up and I, I really can't remember who the photographer was, but it was the quote that, was, that, um, that they uh, presented that said, for the best photography, for the best um, uh, portrait photography, there's a moment when you fall in love with the person that you're photographing. And, uh, and yeah, it really happens. It, it, it happens. And uh, it might seem strange, but yet you fall in love. You want to do absolutely everything possible to make that person look as beautiful or as interesting or, or whatever. And that's, that's the kind of thing that's stayed with me. Oh, that's such a magnificent thing to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. Um, it's wonderful to hear more about what you do and, and how you work. And yeah, congratulations on taking out the best portrait this year. Thank you. Thank you. We're now joined by Michael Klug, who took out the Member for Albert Park Award, which means that uh, his image will be turned into a greeting card to be used by the Honourable Martin Foley throughout this year. The artwork is titled Pause. Um, I might start with a, a similar question again, Michael, um, in terms of what first got you started as a photographer or interested as, uh, in photography as a medium? Um, well, I, in many ways, I sort of was interested in photography as a kid and then um, had a different career and a different life. And when I came to back to Melbourne or back to Victoria, Melbourne in 1995, um, I decided I'd study photography um and so i did, did that part-time while i was um working full-time so it was a four-year course part-time and um so yeah it sort of evolved from there and, and and so i i studied um art photography at the end in the end um and uh it's sort of yeah so that was that was kind of um where it started i guess and that was that was in so I graduated in 1999, so that's 20 years ago, so. Yeah, and you you often photograph scenes or interiors, um, or more recently at least, that have been from the local neighborhood here in St Kilda. Um, okay. I'm interested to know what drew you to the particular scene that we can see in, in the work. Yeah, well, it was, that, was, that was really just a, um, walking around during coronavirus you know it was we couldn't go very far and so i'd take my camera similar to to mark or ruth you know we, we were sort of trapped and but still wanting to express some sort of creativity or still capture images and um so you yeah, know i'm in i'm in st kilda so um you know i was walking around down along the foreshore and and so i just sort of saw that scene you know and 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 so it was it's like that, like I think um, Mark was was um, referring to. It's sometimes you have those aha moments, <laughs> and you see something, and you go, "Oh, I've got to get this," you know. So it was it was really just like that, you know. So mm. but, yeah, yeah, I feel like during during lockdown, lots of people. Um, it was like we could better appreciate the kind of smaller or hidden aspects that were in our local neighbourhood because we had to be there. <laughs> all the time and um which is interesting in relation to your practice um because you you often focus on hidden or overlooked spaces i'm interested to know during that period if if you found that your attention was was taken in a slightly different direction um given that you were kind of we were all um you know more more present within our local environment than ever before yeah, I, like a lot of my work, um, a lot of my art work is about more um, sort of um, using that photography thing where you can record things or you can record things that are behind the scenes or you can record and photograph 
um, images of places that we don't necessarily get to go to. And um, and this, this image is a little bit different in that respect because uh, sort of the last project I was working on was more about, um, uh, it was titled Behind the Facade, but it was sort of going into buildings and places that we probably knew and were familiar with within our local, so within the city of Port Phillip, and then photographing them in a way, recording them, you know, documenting them. In, in, and so it becomes a, a, a snapshot in time where this image is really about walking around and just seeing things and photographing things. Um, I remember going to, when I was at college, our first semester at school was, we would go on awareness walks. And so it was really just about walking around with a camera in hand and just photographing anything that caught your interest. And obviously that was when we were quite naive, I guess, as, as you know, having that photographic, um, you know, that skill or whatever. But um, yeah, so this, this image was really just about that walking around, seeing things and then capturing them, you know, making an image. Yeah. Um, and do you think it was the the emptiness that, that drew you in? Because that particular spot, you know, most locals would know is usually a, a, lot, a buzzing area full of people. Um, right. mm. I think we all got that though, um, you know, in, in that, 5k limit um one hour for exercise you know we would walk down um anywhere where we were and a few of us are in st kilda but um there was no one around you know it was really everything was shut and packed up and you know gathered together as, as in the image you know it's um yeah no there was there was really no one around um yeah. you know people getting their exercise and it was only for an hour a day so some people would do it in the morning and some in the afternoon you know but but um yeah no it was, it was very quiet yeah um it's a beautiful image and you know more than ever because the, the, the absence of people you can really appreciate um the color you know even you know the contrast between those um umbrellas that are down in the water and um, I'm interested to know, given that this will be sent out as a as a greeting card to people, how you might like people to feel when they receive this image. It's a bit it seems almost bittersweet in a way. Well, it's it's I guess a reminder of what we've been through in some ways. You know, it's it's, mm. it's the image is very quiet. It's very still, and um, it sort of uh, it sort of pervades that sense of stillness. And um, I guess. I don't know where we're going and where where we're going to end up, but we can look back at last year and say that um, we've been through a lot, and um, it's been a difficult time for for lots of people to to get through. And and hopefully this is like a little bit of a reminder of of you know the the struggles we all went through through that lockdown time. Mm, yet it does have a serenity to it. Um, yeah, little pops of colour. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, it's oh, lovely great. to hear more about, about the work and uh, congratulations as well. Um, pleasure, Juliet. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're joined by Susan Morris. Hi, Susan. Hi, Julia. Um, Susan won the Best Still Life in Show, supported by Scout, um, for her artwork, Little Banksia. Um, it's a, a beautiful painting. Um, have you been painting for a long time? And uh, what started you with, with painting? Uh, yes, well, I have been painting for a long time, but uh, my background is really as a commercial artist. So I've spent most of my career as a textile designer and illustrator. So uh, I've spent a lot of time painting flowers for all sorts of homewares and, and fashion textiles. And um, now I'm just concentrating on um, uh, painting. So... That's been a new freedom for me and um, interesting um, and challenging um, and yeah, really enjoyable. And have you been painting mainly still lifes? 
Um, I tend to concentrate on plant, painting um, plants, um, so uh, and mostly natives. Um, and somehow I think what I paint falls between the cracks of botanical or and still life because it's not really about um, the objects so much as about the plant. So the vases and the objects that might be in, in my paintings are really subsidiary to the plants themselves. In fact, I almost think of the plants as uh, drawing the plants as like drawing a portrait because you're actually uh, expressing the personality of this little flower or this beautiful leaf or arrangement and um, um, yeah so, so somewhere in the cracks I guess of all those genres but it falls most neatly into um, still life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, did you find that your uh, training in um, textile design um, and, and illustration, has that uh, helped you with your painting or do you think in some way it, um, yeah. you have to remove yourself from other techniques that um, oh, might help? Yes, I'm um, definitely relearning. Um, mm -hmm. And it's nice to make an object for its own sake, not um, to create a design that has to go on another surface. <clears throat> so it, it's um, a different way of looking at it, definitely. Um, and also to get some depth into a painting I'm finding really interesting because I've really, most of my life it's been about pattern and um, repeating and flatness. Um, so yeah, it's it's a definitely a twist. Um, but yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, and has this interest in uh, depicting plants, does that mean that you have to be also quite into horticulture at the same time? <laughs> Well, I guess I'm, a, I'm a country girl at heart. I grew up in the country and I always painted and drew my environment. So, um, you know, I'm just the mad lady in the park with the secateurs. You know? <laughs> uh, I, I do find them very inspiring and particularly um, Australian plants because they're such fantastic structure and um, graphic shapes and but subtlety in the colour and in the textures. Um, so, yeah, they're a very inspiring thing to concentrate on. It's a, that level of concentration is um, its a beautiful meditation, I think, on the beauty of nature and, and um, what you can see when you really, really look hard. <laughs> Absolutely. You touched on it a little bit there, but I, I was going to ask you how you do choose what to paint next and, and what, what plant that you'd like to you know, try and capture next? Well, it usually involves um, a dog walk <laughs> in the park and um, and I just look for um, something that catches my eye, really, and, you know, I don't always find it. Um, and sometimes it's there saying, here I am, paint me. <laughs> so I don't really go out looking for something, but I know what's in season and so, you know, I know when the walk is out. I'll be looking for a you know nice branch wattle. Um, so you get used to your favourite trees and when they're flowering and where they are. So um, yeah, so wherever I go, you know, there's always a different landscape and there's always different opportunities. Um, and it's not just flowers; it might be seed pods or you know other interesting shapes. Mm. Um, Mm. And do you ever paint outside in nature or do you usually bring things back? And, and are you painting from, if you bring things back with you, do you do you ever photograph things and then work from a photograph or is it directly, always directly from the, from real well, life? I always bring them home. I like to be comfortable. <laughs> um, but uh, I always paint from life. Whenever I try and paint from a photo, it just looks flat and two-dimensional and, doesn't really work for me. So uh, over the life of a, a painting, um, the shadows that I paint may have been done in the afternoon, whereas I've probably painted the flowers in the morning. So they're not exactly accurate, but um, I think you, you get more of a sense of light and depth if you paint directly from life. Um, yeah, that and that's that can be a challenge, but you know, once you get started, it's you're fine. <laughs> Just go with it. <laughs> and do you spend a bit of time um, 
trying to work out well I, I guess setting the scene in that way if you're painting straight from from life choosing the jar or the vase or the what mm. else would be in there is that a big part of it or is well, it really yeah sometimes I can you know really spend an hour you know setting or more setting something up getting exactly the right uh composition I mean, this one was pretty spontaneous I just brought it home and popped it in a jar and off we went but um sometimes uh some of the bigger paintings uh you really do need i do need to compose it uh, because i will copy it quite closely from what's in front of me and so sometimes the the composition of setting it up can be um you know half the work really um mm, yeah, yeah so it's a lucky little viewfinder to look at it and um, take photos and you know change things around change the light um, so, yeah, I'm quite conscious of setting it up in the beginning mm -hmm. to get what I want. And <laughs> when it, when it starts to look like a painting, then I'll start to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you, do you often work at this scale or is this quite different for you? Is this much smaller than normal? This is probably, I don't do very big paintings um, just because they're sort of not quite so manageable for me. But, um I wouldn't normally work this small, but it, you know it's a joy because it doesn't take so long, and um, and you have this little jewel of a postcard. <laughs> so God. it's nice to work at this scale. Mm. Mm. And do you look to any other artists for inspiration with your painting? Um, yes, well, there's quite a lot of um, uh, contemporary Australian painters who work um, with with native flora. Um, and, you know, particularly um, John Wolseley, I find, um, who's a St Kilda residence, <laughs> um, I find his work absolutely amazing and beautiful and inspiring in the way he gets right into the landscape, literally, and becomes part of his work. Um, and, yeah, and there's, there's a lot of um, painters that are, are doing fantastic work at the moment in this field, yeah. Yes. Well, it's gorgeous work and congratulations yeah. on the win. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Susan. Oh, thank you, Juliet. And thank you to Lyndon and to Scout too for the, the prize. It's wonderful to be part of. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>
and to you, our audience, for joining us this evening. Um, stay well and safe, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you at the gallery very soon. Thank you.